So yeah, I would like to welcome again everyone to the session. Um, my name is Julia Blasch. I'm from the Free University of Amsterdam and I'm coordinating a Horizon 2020 project called Newcomers on New Clean uh, Energy Communities. And this session today is a joint session of four Horizon 2020 projects. And you can see them here. It's the Comets project, the Social Res project, the Newcomers project, and the Sonnet project. And these uh, four projects have something in common. We all do research on social innovation in the energy transition, and in particular on collective action initiatives in the energy transition. So this is why our session today is entitled uh, Collective Action for the Energy Transition, Emergence, Perceived uh, Benefits and Potential for Scaling. So we wanna see what are our common findings uh, with respect to the potential of these initiatives. Um, yeah, we called the session Collective Action in Initiatives, but you will actually see that at least three out of the four presentations are specifically about energy communities. The housekeeping rules, I think after three days of conference, you're familiar with them. Um, so basically um, keep your microphone and camera off unless you are uh, the speaker. Um, the speakers will share their screen in the usual way it is done in Zoom. And the audience uh, is very much encouraged to ask questions and please do so through the chat function. And I, as a moderator, I will then collect these questions and ask them to the speakers. For the speakers, we agreed that you have about 12 minutes and I will give you then a sign uh, when these 12 minutes are over. We will have four presentations today. The first one from uh, Dr. Chiara Candelise from Bocconi University. Um, now I have to make this window smaller. Um, who will present her research on uh, typologies and determinants of collective action initiatives. And she will present results from a survey. Then we have Dr. Hang Yan Wu from Trinity College Dublin from the Social Rest Project. Um, who presents results from a choice experiment where he wants to find out whether EU citizens are willing to engage with community-based energy cooperatives. Uh, then we have Dr. Tanya Kamin from University of Ljubljana from the Newcomers Project, who shares also results of a, sur uh, of a survey or interviews uh, with members of energy communities. She wanted to find out what benefits do these members perceive when they are part of an energy community. And lastly, we have Adelie Ronville from Grenoble Ecole de Management, um, who also presents on energy cooperatives in France, Germany, and Switzerland, and in particular, um, the scaling patterns in different institutional contexts. And at the end, hopefully, we still have time left so that we can have a, a panel or plenary discussion with all the speakers. I see that Chiara has arrived, so we're very happy about that. Uh, Chiara, are you ready for presenting? Okay, good morning everyone. Thank you for for for, for the session. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to be presenting uh, results from one of the work packages of the Comets project. Um, and therefore, I'm going to be presenting firstly quickly the Comets project itself. And then um, I'm going to present how the, the survey has been designed and um, um, as I said, I'm gonna be presenting the work package I'm gonna be presenting is, is the survey. So I'm gonna be quickly presenting the survey and then uh, the results, some of the results of the survey. So Comets is a, a Horizon 2020 project that aims at building knowledge on uh, social innovative processes in the energy transition as implemented by collective action initiatives. So the idea is to, uh, the, the aim of the project is to produce a series of tools to assess guys, uh, to assess their performance and their aggregate estimates in their current and potential contribution to the energy transition. And, and of course, on the basis of that, the idea is to uh, provide recommendation to improve um, the, the development, startups and development and upscaling of uh, kites activities. Uh, the consortium is made of 12 partners uh, across eight uh, EU countries. It's a fairly academic uh, consortium. Uh, it's made by six uh, academic bodies. 
three EU level organizations. You can see the logos in the, in, in the map there. One energy agency and, and two research centers. Um, this is the work plan of Comet's project. Um, the red line is where we are at the moment. The project is going to last another year. Uh, it's going to end next year. Uh, so far, uh, as you, uh, what you see in the graph are the different um, work packages and, and, and products and tools uh, produced by the project to date. So you, you, um, uh, uh, one of the, the, the work package two is the production. Well, once the, the analytical framework has been defined for the project and within that, skies have been uh, defined, um, uh, the, the one of the, the, the outcome is the production of uh, an inventory of KAIs across across EU. Um, another one is the survey, which is the one I'm going to be presenting today. Uh, the project also involves uh, the, the the analysis of case studies. So there is a let's say an involvement, an engagement of the project with the with the initiatives uh, across. In, across countries and this is where where we are at the moment um, then there will be an analysis of some frontier case studies and then there will be a wrap up with with some scenarios and roadmap analysis of guys in the in, in EU in the energy transition uh, the survey uh, has been designed uh, by Vito, which is one of the of the uh, project partners, and the, the structure uh, of of the survey has been uh, has been the survey has been structured so that uh, first in, in different uh, sections uh, the questions um, were about 40, 48. Um, the initially, of course, um, um, information about privacy and key data of the organization have been asked. And then the first part is all about how the, the initiative has been initiated, has been started. Um, the second part is about the, the focus of the initiatives in terms of activity and the, the, the expected impact of the of the initiative, both in, term, in, the, in the energy transition and more wider impacts in terms of environmental and social impacts. Then there is there was a section on um, aimed at um, uh, analyzing the, the how the governance and the uh, of those initiatives were uh, was uh, was defined and uh, what was the level and the, and the the quality of citizen participation into these initiatives. Um, then there were sex, uh, questions about the, the context in which the initiatives were um, were or, or the characteristics of those initiatives in 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 the environment. Uh, and then final sections about challenges, barriers, and opportunities mainly with the view of then uh, working with those initiatives in the case studies. Um, as you see uh, here, are the numbers of, of, of the number of guys that have been contacted by the national uh, partners. Uh, as you can see, many have been contacted, not all uh, have responded, uh, but we, have, we had a quite decent um, rate of response. Um, then uh, we, we filtered some initiatives where uh, where the questionnaires were not complete enough and, and so on. So the final number of, of answers to the question by Kais was, is um, uh, 206. Then let me go into the results. Hope you can see. Okay. Um, we decided to uh, structure the results across five dimensions. Uh, so the, the dimensions are those you see in the slides. So the dynamics of creation. So all that has to to, to do with the, as I said, the 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 the, 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 the creation, the, the the how the the initiative have been have been started, uh, the organizational structure, the financing, how the initiatives have been financed. Uh, an analysis of the CAI's activities in the energy transition and an analysis of the social impact. Um, the, the result of the survey have been uh, presented and collected in the, in the report, which is available on Comet's website. What, I, what I'm going to be presenting today are the results of some of the questions included in, in the survey. Uh, for, the, for the interest of time, it would have been difficult to present all the, uh, of the questions, but we, we have chosen the more 
possibly the more representative questions for each of these uh, five dimensions. Uh, so in terms of dynamics of creation, the, the questions, uh, the results you see here are from two questions. The first one is who was behind the origin the, of the idea, who initiated the initiative? And as you can see, there is a majority of initiatives uh, initiated by citizens. So there is, this is shows, this shows how these initiatives are in fact fairly bottom up initiatives. And there is an interesting role of municipality. Uh, which, uh, which in some cases have played a role in in, in facilitating the the start and the and the and the, and the and the and the construction of the initiative. Um, the second question is, who were the initial investors? So, um, who who contributed most to to the starting up from the financial point of view of the initiative? And even uh, also in this case, you can see there is a majority of uh, answers from. Citizens. So there is a majority of initiatives uh, which have been uh, funded uh, by by citizens themselves, and there is uh, the other the other um, the other uh, high number in terms of answer is public grants, and. Uh, Main, most of many of these public grants are public grants that, that have been, um, um, let's say, uh, facilitated by municipalities. So this is um, so you can see that there is a, a common, a common um, recurring role for municipalities in initiating and supporting the, the, these initiatives. Uh, sorry, I didn't say. Of course, this this table presents uh, results for each each column. It presents results for each country. Uh, and the total is the total across the six countries um, where the surveys have been have been uh, rolled out. Um, in terms of organizational structure, uh, we show the results for uh, two questions. Uh, the first one uh, is about the legal uh, form uh, used by these initiatives. I must say that, that a majority of the guys surveyed are energy communities. And within those, there is a high prevalence of uh, cooperatives, as you can see. And it, this, this graph shows results per country and the cooperatives are the majority of initiatives in Belgium, Netherlands, Italy, and Spain, uh, much less in Estonia and Poland, but this is due mainly to a uh, different, uh, let's say, legal system and also to a um, lower level of development of, in particular, energy communities in those two countries. In terms of dimension of, of, of these initiatives, um, there is a, a, a majority of initiatives are fairly small small or small medium size what you see here in, in the graphs is is the number of members so uh, for, for example in belgium there is a majority of initiatives which have uh, between 10 and and 1000 members uh, and, and 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 similarly in other countries as you can see the majority is between uh, has members between let's say 1 and 1000 um, in terms of financing, um, there were a few questions that they were looking at how the initiatives kept financing uh, their activities after the initi initiation. Um, we've seen already the question about the initial investors, and we've seen that there was a prev prevalence of citizens uh, financing those initiatives. As you can see, this, this is a question on, let's say, today investors. and members which are again mainly citizens uh, are the majority of 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 um, answers in terms of who is to, is investing today so it looks like uh, members keeps uh, investing in these initiatives and there is a role again for public authorities again this is mainly municipalities and banks and this is shows this shows that these initiatives are able to um, to leverage, let's say, debt on on the on the private pro, private market, uh, similarly to more traditional actors in the energy sector. 
in terms of activities, um, let's say activities intended like intended as environment, as geographical scope of of these of these initiatives, uh, there is a prevalence of local initiatives. By local, here we look at local, local mainly at municipality level and regional. So there are several initiatives which are um, which are which have activities at, at the regional level, so across more than one municipality. And there is a fairly fairly fair split between, between rural and urban areas of activity. Now, Chiara, we are now at 12 minutes, so oh, just for you wow. to know. <laughs> uh, so I'll be very quick then. So a couple of, couple of more results. Um, uh, in terms of activities, Uh, along the supply chain, uh, the majority of initiatives, as you can see here, are focused on generation from renewable electricity. And within that, of those, there is a majority that, that deploy PV plants, as you can see here. Uh, in terms of other activities along the energy supply chain, there, is, there are some initiatives that are involved, they are starting to be involved in e-mobility. And there is a fair number of initiatives that are involved in different type of energy efficiency services, as you can see in the other slide, in the other. Um, two other slides very quickly about wider activities. So these guys, apart from acting in the energy supply chain, they also have wider objectives in terms of environmental care activities, in terms of uh, mobilization of civil society, in terms of education on environmental care and development of knowledge and local skills for the community. They also have uh, interest in creating social impact. So for example, this question shows the different type of uh, answers to the, the different type of Uh, social impacts that they are at least willing to create these initiatives. And the one on, on the, the graph on the bottom shows that the majority of initiatives have at least concern in terms of uh, energy poverty and they have um, they, are, they intend to implement uh, activities that can ease uh, energy poverty uh, across the communities they are they are serving. And with that, I've finished. Um, for context, um, you have me for, for the survey and Alessandro Schulo, which is the coordinator of the project uh, from UNITO, uh, which also uh, collaborated with, with us, the uh, University of Bocconi, to the development of, of to, to the result, to analyzing the result of this survey. And I'm here for questions for later on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chiara, for this very insightful and clear presentation. I think we have uh, space for one or two clarifying questions, if there are any in the audience. Um, can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Um, what was the biggest struggle or challenge for you to conduct this survey? Any kind of obstacles or barriers? Thank you. To conduct the survey, you mean to not to analyze the result, to conduct the survey. Well, I guess reaching reaching out the the the, the guys. Uh, the effort has been uh, well. I didn't mention I had a slide on that. Uh, so uh, reaching out to the guys involved uh, several several activities, um, national workshops, then looking for. Um, for for uh, contact details, uh, we we had we had a fair list of guys uh, in each country because that was part of the the work we've been doing for to support the work package too. So the the creation of the inventory, but uh, from having a list of uh, guys and uh, funding the, the 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 contact contact details and. Uh, at, um, reaching out them and achieving uh, and the, the 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 high number of responses to the survey that I think was the the, the major uh, challenge of the survey itself. But from the point of resistance uh, from some commun communities, did you have some resistance to kind of get into the information you actually need? Uh, Well, I have to say we, we dealt with guys in each uh, representative country. Uh, so personally, with, with, uh, with UNITO, we dealt with uh, guys in Italy. And I have to say that uh, the Italian sample for 
was fairly uh, fairly um, fairly small, fairly small, but mostly uh, we had personal contact with several of those initiatives. So that was uh, it was a e- e- easy was an easy way to um, uh, e- easy to easier to to get to them. So in terms of uh, no, I mean in general the initiatives that were able to dedicate time maybe that's that was the major barrier so the, generally these initiatives are uh, constrained in time because uh, in, in many cases there are uh, people are working on the vol- voluntary basis uh, so yeah um sorry okay so yeah so time 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 commitment Maybe was one of the major barrier for them in order to be able to to answer the the, the questionnaire. Otherwise, happy to share their their experiences. Hope hey, thank you, thank you very much, Chiara. Yeah, I think with this we should move on to the second presentation um, from Hang Jian Wu from um, Trinity College Dublin, who will present his findings from a choice experiment among European citizens. Great. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Thank you for joining this uh, special session. My name is Hang Jian Wu uh, from Social Rust. So before uh, presenting our research, I would like to quickly introduce the Social Rust project. And uh, so Social Rust is an EU-funded uh, research project which aims to close the non-technical research gaps uh, that impede the, the widespread uptake of social innovation business in the energy sector. So. Uh, the socially innovative business models concerned in this project uh, are energy cooperatives, crowdfunding platforms, and aggregators. Uh, so the work package, our Trinity team uh, uh, focuses on is to understand how citizens uh, make decisions to engage with uh, energy cooperatives and, and other uh, business models and whether their behavior patterns are different from those of the existing customers who have already had uh, investment or consumption experience. So in the next 10 to 15 minutes, uh, I would like to share uh, some of our preliminary findings uh, regarding people's perception of energy cooperatives. Okay, so first, uh, let me give you some highlights of this research. We investigate citizens' intention uh, to invest uh, uh, in renewable projects uh, operated by energy cooperatives. We conducted the large-scale choice experiment in different European countries for the general public and the cooperative members. So the results suggest that citizens' investment choices are motivated by both financial returns and environmental concerns. And the quality members and the general public are different regarding individual characteristics and investment motivations. So, uh, so now uh, I would like to introduce the motivation of the research. So, uh, as we have all known, that uh, climate change is a global threat, and and the EU uh, European governments have implemented a series of policies to tackle the problem and one goal is to increase renewable uptake uh, in, in different sectors. So according to the European Green Deal, uh, so the EU countries uh, aim to achieve an overall 20% uh, uh, renewable share uh, in final energy consumption by the end of 2020. Um, as you can see in this figure, uh, although the EU on average has achieved uh, the, the target, uh, however, uh, some countries, for example, France and Poland, uh, are still for short of their uh, country's targets. So that simply suggests that a more effort is needed, and especially from the citizen side. So an increasingly uh, uh, popular uh, uh, business model to finance renewable project uh, uh, in the EU uh, is the energy cooperatives, uh, which is characterized by uh, energy localization and commitment to energy democracy. And the members uh, can enjoy a wide range of benefits. So uh, in terms of investigation of uh, citizens' 
perception of energy cooperatives. So previous literature predominantly focused on the German population and potentially ignore the differences uh, uh, in citizens' perception across different European countries. So we close the gap and investigate citizens wants to engage with energy cooperatives by conducting a large scale uh, survey across multiple European countries. So, uh, so we will answer the following two questions. First, what aspects of energy cooperatives are important to attract investors? And second, how do cooperative members differ from the general public? Okay, now turning to the data collection and survey design. So uh, the data collection was conducted among the general public in Germany, France, Spain, Sweden, and Poland, uh, with each uh, with um, six six hundred uh, respondents in each country, which gives us a total of three thousand respondents. So we conducted the same survey for members of our partnered energy cooperatives, uh, which gives us another two fifty nine respondents. So we, uh, the survey uh, was conducted uh, on a, a popular survey platform called Cortex. And, and we uh, added a quarter can choose so that the, the general public sample is representative in terms of age, gender, and regions. So the specific survey method uh, we used is called the choice experiment. So basically uh, in a, Hypothetical contacts, respondents were asked to choose their preferred renewable projects operated by energy cooperatives from project A, project B, and an opt-out option. Uh, so uh, they have to consider all the attributes uh, in their decision making, for example, any return, uh, uh, carbon uh, reduction, and some corporate characteristics. And uh, so uh, for audience who are interested about the, the attribute table, I will show you later uh, at the Q&A session. So each respondent faces eight choices like that, but with varied uh, levels of attributes in different choice cards. With choice experiments, we are able to quantify uh, citizens preferences uh, in different, uh, for different characteristics of energy cooperatives. Okay, now turning to the results section. Uh, uh, first, let's focus on the results of the, the, of the general public. So if you look at the, this figure, uh, the panel on the left <coughs> represents uh, different characteristics of a typical energy uh, cooperative. And the bars represent the extent to which um, uh, the, the, uh, a, a level is uh, preferred over the, uh, the alternative level of the attribute. And the blue bars uh, mean that uh, respondents have positive preferences and red bar means respondents have negative preference. So the bigger the blue bar, the more the respondents value uh, uh, an alternative level relative to the reference level. Okay, so firstly, uh, we can see that uh, respondents prefer higher annual return uh, in, in for the invested renewable project, which is quite sensible. And then uh, they prefer solar rather than wind technology uh, for the renewable projects. And for carbon reduction, uh, we observed that on average, uh, the, the higher uh, the level of carbon reduction, the more the respondents prefer. In terms of uh, location, uh, lo uh, location of the renewable projects, uh, we find that uh, respondents do not care uh, uh, whether the, the, the projects uh, are built within their regions uh, or countries compared with being built in the local areas. However, they are highly against uh, the situation where it is uh, built outside their countries. They also dislike uh, uh, investment requirements, uh, such as uh, higher minimum uh, investment amount and duration. And finally, uh, although energy cooperatives members uh, uh, are allowed to participate in decision-making uh, of organizations' important affairs, 
uh, it seems that they are not interested about uh, these uh, participatory meetings. Okay, so uh, now uh, uh, let me introduce uh, the results uh, that reflected the comparison between the general public and the cooperative members. So here, uh, the green bars represent the general public sample and the yellow bars represent the cooperative member sample. So there are two key differences I, I want to emphasize here. First, uh, so we have mentioned that uh, the general public uh, uh, dislike the, the, group re the renewable projects to be built outside their country. However, we find that for cooperative members, the opposition is even stronger. And second, uh, we, we have mentioned that uh, the, the general public are not interested uh, about participation meetings. But for cooperative members, uh, we find that they show significantly more interest towards those meetings. Okay, so uh, in terms of a profile comparis comparison between the two samples, let me show you some uh, more intuitive results. As you can see in this figure, uh, cooperative members are more educated, they having more income, are more likely to be female, uh, more concerned about climate change, and are politically more left-wing. So uh, they also more likely to own an EV or hybrid car, um, but, uh, and, but uh, they are not quite different uh, from the general public in, in terms of uh, behaviors in uh, residential heating. And cooperative members are also <clears throat> Uh, more likely to, uh, to use electricity during the off-peak time, uh, regardless of the reduced tariff rates. Okay, so uh, in summary, so we, we, so, uh, we find that uh, uh, the investment decision of the general public are motivated by both financial returns and, and environment concerns, and they dislike investment requirements such as minimum amount of investment and they are not interested in participatory meetings. And we observe significant difference between the, the general public and the cooperative members regarding social demographics, energy behaviors, and, and, uh, and preferences for uh, energy cooperative characteristics. Particularly, cooperative members have stronger opposition to projects that are built outside their countries and they are more interested in participation meetings. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Thank you very much, Hang Yang. It was also a very interesting and clear presentation. Um, are there any questions? Um, there is one question whether you could show again the gender of energy cooperative members. Yeah. So basically here we, we, we observed that 70% uh, 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 respondents uh, of, of the corporate member sample is female, uh, while uh, only 50% are female in, for the general public. So here, uh, one caveat here is that for the general public sample, we control for, uh, we, we add a quarter controls to, to uh, guarantee the, the representativeness of the sample. So uh, it, I'm not quite uh, surprised to see as 51% because we want to keep it balanced. However, for the quarter members, um, so the representative is not guaranteed. So what we did is we simply sent emails uh, to our collaborated energy uh, cooperative, uh, cooperatives and, and and to ask uh, if uh, their members are interested to participate in the survey. So uh, there's no mean that we can control for representatives. So uh, that's uh, probably why that the, the, the members, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, percentage of gender uh, in terms of female is a bit higher for the corporate members. And because usually previous studies show the opposite, so it's uh, spread. Oh, really? That's that's yeah. quite interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. So as I said, the representative is is not guaranteed for the quarter members. So we we tried actually. Uh, we we after we we 
uh, we have fin uh, completed our preliminary results, we send the results to our partners and uh, ask them to check if it is consistent uh, with uh, the general statistics of, of their uh, cooperative. So, so far we have uh, received one uh, response uh, uh, from, from uh, our uh, partner energy cooperatives and they said basically uh, yes uh, there's a, a problem with uh, the, the representatives in terms in terms of gender so they they are so their gender is quite balanced in in their cooperatives so we are still uh, uh, looking for more uh, responses from other uh, cooperative, uh, cooperatives to decide uh, to finally decide whether our uh, cooperative, cooperative member sample is representative or not. So thanks. We have another question from Noam, uh, which is a bit more yeah, fundamental, philosophical, uh, <laughs> whether yeah. these initiatives are still collective action initiatives or social innovation if people are mainly interested in the investment and not so much in the collective experience. <laughs> Um, so maybe this is something that would also be very nice to discuss later in the in the general discussion. Um, maybe I have just a very quick question because you said you did this in uh, I think was it five or six countries? Could you also find any differences between the countries? Yeah, actually, we we do have results uh, that show the difference between the, the countries. Uh, we we haven't uh, uh, we we decided not to present here because we have so many results to present. Uh, uh, but I, I, I'll quickly show you the results. So first, we find that actually. Um, uh, the Spanish uh, respondents are a bit different uh, from from the respondents in other countries. So for the carbon, so for the carbon reduction, so if I can show you. So, so for the for the carbon reduction uh, uh, attribute, so Spanish uh, respondents always prefer higher uh, level of carbon reduction. However, for uh, respondents in other countries, uh, we don't observe this trend, uh, especially uh, uh, from the the uh, six thousand uh, to uh, twelve thousand. Uh, we find that in other countries, uh, they are not. They do not uh, care about higher uh, amounts of uh, carbon reduction, uh, but for the Spanish, they always uh, uh, expect higher interests uh, in uh, for for higher level of carbon reduction. And also, uh, we find that uh, uh, Spanish uh, respondents are very interested about uh, the the participatory meetings. However, uh, you can see here on average. Uh, people do not care. That's because the other four countries uh, respondents are not care about those participation meetings. So that's that's the difference. Hey, thanks very much. Very interesting. Okay. Um, yeah. So thank you very can much I, for the I presentation. Yeah. Please. Okay. Um, and then we can move on to Tanya's presentation. Tanya Kamin from University of Ljubljana. Who will share results from interviews with community members? Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to this session. So I'm going to share with you today some results that were gathered uh, in the framework of newcomers project, uh, newcomers for exploring new energy communities. So. Um, um, to uh, give you just a brief. Um, overview of the uh, newcomers project itself. Uh, so we, what we want to study uh, here with eight partners from six European countries like Netherlands, Sweden, UK, uh, 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 Germany, Slovenia and Italy uh, in 13 energy communities are the following actually questions. It's actually a very complex project uh, with a lot of uh, work packages, but here I'm just gonna share some of the key research uh, questions. So the first one is which uh, national settings enable or prevent the emergence of which types of new clean energy communities? The second question that we deal with is how do different types of new clean energy communities emerge and operate? 
then what is the potential of different types of new clean, uh, clean energy communities to stimulate energy conservation and demand response? And finally, which values do different types of new clean energy communities provide for their members and society? And with this question, I'm going to actually deal with uh, in this presentation. So what I'm going to present you today are part of the results from the work package six, uh, which are um, also already um, published in uh, deliverable and um, in which we actually we wanted to provide answers on um, two main research questions. So, uh, one is uh, we wanted to identify the, the variety of possible benefits of new clean energy communities and types of value they have for their members. Um, and could also have for society at large. And then the second one was we tried to identify with this uh, qualitative research as well, members' uh, assessment of the potential of clean energy communities in supporting the clean energy uh, transition. So our research design was, um, I should say, people-centered in this case, uh, in the World Package 6, meaning that in order to predict and steer behaviors related to energy conservation and transition to clean energy systems, we first uh, needed to evaluate energy communities from the position of those who actually experience them firsthand. So from the energy community members themselves. Thus, uh, we were interested, for example, in experience with processes of becoming an energy community member, but also of being an energy community member. Um, um, in this context, we aim to understand, for example, why um, a membership in the clean energy community members uh, matters actually to, to people that join energy communities and why they think, for example, the clean, um, uh, clean energy communities could actually matter to other people and also to larger society. So we switched our focus from benefits to actually trying to identify the values so the perceptions of benefits uh, of the energy community members. Um, by focusing on consumers, prosumers, or citizens, um, energy-related behaviors um, in their actually everyday life settings, which means focusing on micro environment and also micro politics. Uh, we aim to capture the varieties of values that clean energy community members find in alternative energy service models. For example, um, this is also indicative then for uh, meso and also macro social processes. Um, and uh, what we want, I want to stress here already is that energy conservation is not necessarily among the most important values perceived by clean energy community uh, members uh, that we studied. Uh, for example, we found uh, that uh, um, many other values, very important, like functional, economical, social, uh, ecological values, uh, uh, and these were, these were actually the most exposed uh, uh, also in the uh, clean energy community members and did receive um, in relation to their involvement with clean energy communities. Um, and um, now I would like to briefly explain you the methodology of this first um, part of work package six, which is the qualitative research. So for, for these tasks, we uh, actually gathered, um, we, we conducted uh, in-depth interviews with 40 members of energy communities from six countries, uh, partnering countries. Um, and we, of course, we recorded and transcribed uh, um, these interviews and translated them to English. Uh, once we did that, we analyzed all the data with Max Curier, uh, and conducted actually both inductive and deductive thematic analysis. Um, so here I'm just going to go through the main themes we identified. For example, important uh, was the experience, uh, experience value types related to membership in clean energy communities. Then we also identified an important topic on the level of involvement in the clean energy community. Um, a big, uh, very important uh, topic, uh, theme on knowledge, skills and learning processes in the clean energy community. 
uh, different factors influencing dissemination of the clean energy communities from, from the members' perspectives again. Then reasons and motives for joining the clean energy community, attitudes, beliefs, and understanding with regard to the role uh, of clean energy community and drastic environmental issues and uh, everyday practices and behavior change in the clean energy community after uh, people actually that we interviewed joined clean energy communities. And one of the very important issues that also came up was the questions of, uh, was the issue of trust in, in the actors involved in the clean energy communities. Um, our study actually reveals that clean energy communities uh, often represent a catalyst for innovation, for energy related activities, but also for other environmental activities in general, which I find very uh, important. The communities produce a lot of valuable uh, knowledge that could help setting up and operating uh, other and new clean energy communities. However, with this is related also one of the actually future opportunities because our research shows a lack um, and thus also a need for a better system for sharing accumulated knowledge with the interested public in, in the European Union about setting up and running uh, clean energy uh, communities. So we think that better dissemination of information about the experiences um, uh, within with the clean energy communities, the membership, and also uh, perceived energy community benefits is actually necessary for scaling up clean energy community uh, in the European Union actually utilize decentralized uh, energy systems. Um, uh, I will briefly now show you the uh, a model which somehow summarizes our uh, results of this first qualitative part of the work package six. And uh, it's actually based on individual value practice uh, model um, with important, and it includes actually important components that uh, influence um, um, clean energy community uh, members behavior. Uh, and these are actually meaning, competences, material, and uh, value. This model um, allowed us to take an overall view of how community members behaved with regard to energy-related activities in their households um, and also in their communities, um, while recognizes also interactions between model components, uh, which I... Uh, exposed before, and between also different actors or uh, factors that uh, actually affected members' behavior in the experienced um, uh, and the experienced value of such uh, behaviors. So, taking this holistic uh, perspective, we were also able to explore and take into account uh, social relations uh, uh, within but also outside of the communities. Then, for example, the knowledge flows, material infrastructures, and contexts. Um, and also, we were able to observe how they were um, connected with these uh, individual factors and reflected also in perceived uh, values and practices. This was the first stage building this model that will actually, that is leading us also to the second stage um, of, uh, for which um, we are still collecting quantitative data uh, uh, within uh, uh, um, uh, energy community members. And I cannot share the results yet because we are still uh, actually gathering the, the data. Um, but uh, this model actually gives us uh, an important insight uh, maybe besides those that I already stated, I would like to uh, maybe expose as well that it's really important to uh, acknowledge that people are motivated to join clean energy communities for various different reasons and that energy conservation is actually not necessarily one of them. Uh, on the contrary, um, some people are motivated to join clean energy communities um, uh, in order to be able to consume even more energy and also at times that suits them best according to their daily routines and their lifestyles. So, um, but it's really important that uh, uh, when this was actually the case, the, the, the wish or desire to use uh, 
and be more free in consuming greater amounts of uh, energy at whatever times, it's in- important to state that all our um, uh, interviewees were actually exposing importance of having clear conscience not to contribute to um, uh, CO2 footprint with bigger uh, or bigger CO2 footprint with uh, bigger um, uh, or, uh, use of um, energy in their households. Therefore, with this, for example, uh, with knowing this, it's, I think it's really important to expose that uh, when we think about upscaling uh, clean energy communities in the European Union and Promo, uh, maybe the exposing prom, uh, um, reduction or energy conservation as the most important benefit of, of joining energy, uh, or clean energy uh, communities, maybe isn't the best strategy. Uh, but uh, uh, at least our research so far shows other values and other benefits, perceived benefits, are probably more important to talk about, to um, convince, um, let's say, general society about thinking to uh, um, transit to uh, more renewable energy sources or joint energy communities. So I will complete uh, with this and, and invite you for questions and discussion. Thank you very much, Tanya. Yeah, are there any questions for clarification for Tanya? It seems to be the case at this point. Um, so then I suggest that we move on to Adelie's presentation and then uh, we can come back to your presentation in the discussion. Uh, so thank you for uh, welcoming me in this session. Uh, I'm from uh, uh, Grenoble Ecole Management and University Savoie Mont Blanc, and I will present you. Uh, uh, some work of Sonnet on energy cooperatives with some uh, some inputs of my colleague Yasmin. So the Sonnet project, uh, we are a consortium uh, with uh, academic and public actors, and uh, we aim to co-create with them a rich understanding of diversity processes, contributions, success, and potential of social innovation in the energy sector. Uh, globally, uh, we have a conceptual framework for the whole project and some such questions. We have a definition of social innovation as ideas, objects, and activities that change social relations in a way, um, new ways to do, think, and organize energy. We have a multi method research design globally with uh, some experimental uh, kind of research action with city labs, um, case studies. Uh, a review of the mapping of an existing initiatives and a survey uh, of uh, 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 representative samples in different countries. So, and today I will talk about. Uh, so, from our mapping of uh, of different initiatives, we created the typology that you can find uh, with the uh, in the deliverable. And uh, in this presentation, I focus in one. Um, when the type of initiatives that we, that we choose, that is energy cooperatives. So we define the uh, energy cooperatives as joint um, uh, ownership and uh, participation in, in renewable energy productions with uh, ICA principles. Our research question are, uh, how do these energy cooperatives uh, and their field emerge, develop and institutionalize over time? And how this process is shaped by the environment uh, and the environmental uh, institutional environment. So to study this, we have also a conceptual framework to define uh, what what we mean by all that, which is quite complex. But what is important to 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 see is that we have uh, one uh, the, the energy cooperatives as um, as a sub um, actors within. A field which is within an institutional environment, and that there, there are feedback loops in how they define each other. That's the assumptions. So, to study that, we have an embedded case study approach in which we have the initiatives and we study them uh, in conjunction with uh, other actors with whom they interact and their institutional environment. 
for cooperatives, we are looking at three countries, France, uh, Germany, and Switzerland, with uh, my two colleagues. We did uh, interviews, observation, documentary analysis. For that, we wrote some uh, reports for each country. And now I'm presenting the kind of uh, comparison of what we found for different countries. So uh, what does it look like as a field for energy cooperatives? In France, we have um, around 200 or more energy cooperatives, and they are quite uh, structured within uh, networks that cover the, the whole countries. Uh, they have uh, values of uh, localism, uh, democratic governance, and ecology, and they are strongly networking. So uh, from the analysis, we built some timelines to analyze how this field evolved. So in the case of France, uh, it starts with, uh, with some pioneer initiatives that are also encouraged by some EU programs. And uh, also what helped them to emerge is the first alternative narratives about energy transition in France, which is the Negawatt scenario. Uh, from this, we had some very pioneer actors that emerged, and um, there was so much constraint on them that they really quickly um, converged to into national actors in intermediary organizations to help kind of raise the barriers that they faced. Uh, from 2015, there is uh, some policy changes that uh, helped them to develop, uh, including a more favor favorable uh, legal framework. And uh, that's why we start um, uh, from uh, 2015 to have a growth phase of uh, the number of cooperatives that is created. So in this phase, there is a growth in which the pioneer projects are replicated, uh, also thanks to uh, favorable feed-in tariffs for renewable energy. Uh, actually, uh, like, uh, Finally, around now, this period, the phase in which we are now, uh, from um, 2017 for France, uh, there is a strong structuration of the actors going on at the national level um, around these intermediary actors that are also converging. There was there were two of them, and now they are converging into a partnership. Um, but uh, they are facing some changes in how renewable energy is, is um, supported and this is challenging the current uh, models and their business models and how they function. And in France, of course, there is a EU, for Europe, European countries, the EU directives on community energy that provide some opportunity to discuss with policymakers uh, what makes definition of energy cooperatives, which in case actually is more called a citizen energy project. In Switzerland, um, there is also kind of uh, around the same number of cooperatives, but it started um, earlier. Uh, there is often strong collaboration with municipalities um, uh, and, uh, and relationship with local uh, service operators that uh, is sometimes favorable, sometimes not, but uh, usually it's key. Regarding the, the timeline of this um, of the evolution of uh, dynamics of development of cooperatives in uh, Germany, no, sorry, Germany, Switzerland, uh, we have a first wave of, um, of creation of energy cooperatives uh, around the, the anti-nuclear movement uh, in, the, in the 19s. Uh, but then did you have a kind of stagnation phase and uh, we have a second wave from 2005 with the emergence of national policies and federal support for renewable energy, which helps to secure new, uh, uh, new economic viability for this kind of projects. And uh, from, uh, from this phase, they, they don't necessarily focus on uh, anti-nuclear uh, motivations in this course, at least. Uh, and from 2012, uh, there are also some changing conditions in the support schemes. And uh, this is uh, reducing the 
to economic viability of projects, and we also uh, observe a decline in the, in the number of newly created projects. So this challenges the, the, the cooperatives and, and uh, they also have to change business models. So for Switzerland, that's also from, uh, from this point in uh, 2015, uh, that we observe the emergence of intermediary actors that, um, that start to, to articulate uh, energy cooperative uh, interests. They also start to diversify into new other activities, such as self-consumption, housing cooperative, so. For Germany, I will leave my colleague Jasmine to present the case. Jasmine. Thank you, Adeli. Um, also in Germany, energy cooperatives already existed in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, back then they provided the population, more the rural population with electricity. And of those energy cooperatives we have today around 50, while the total amount of energy cooperatives for Germany is 843 with around 200,000 members. Um, their overarching main goal is most of the time to contribute to the energy transition um, by active participation of citizens. Uh, they furthermore want to contribute to the decentralization as well as the democratization of the energy system. And other aims are their aspirations to contribute to the regional development as well as the consumption of their own electricity. Um, I would need the next slide with the innovation timer. Thank you. Um, the innovation timeline we drew from the results can be divided into four phases, which you can see on top of the slide. Uh, the first phase can be seen as the policy foundation phase. Um, there we have the implementation. Um, those policy changes in addition to the uh, increasing environmental awareness as well as the general trend of citizen participation led to the second phase, which started from around 2007 and led to a remarkable increase of newly established energy cooperatives, which, as you can see, finally spiked in 2011. The the third phase then, which is starting from 2012 on, is um, characterized by a change of those policy conditions and, on the other hand, increased networking activities of the field, um, which then led to the creation of regional as well as national intermediaries of the field. And at the same time, we can see that the number of newly established cooperatives started to drop. Um, this trend of, of dropping newly established energy cooperatives uh, continued in the fourth phase, wherein also the auction model uh, was implemented to replace the uh, feed-in tariff model. And uh, another um, important development of that phase is that the continued work of the intermediaries also started to a diverse uh, led to a diversification of the business models in the field of energy cooperatives in Germany. Yeah, that's so far yeah, it thanks. for Germany. So from this, we, we try to compare all the, these cases. So I want to present you the, the tables that we are currently working on. It's still a work in progress. But uh, for just to underlay a, a few points that we find is that uh, regarding collective action, we found that uh, the, the cooperation between cooperatives actually occur uh, to, to create um, intermediary organization when they face strong obstacles. So in France, uh, it, it's actually interesting to see that the intermediaries uh, emerge quite almost before the scaling of, of the, the, the cooperatives and the, their applications. Uh, while uh, in the uh, in the Switzerland Germany they appear a bit later and the, the structuration appear later. We also found that um, not it's not unsurprising, but it's interesting to 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 note it that uh, they're highly dependent on the support schemes for renewable energy and on the legal framework that actually authorize them to uh, function as cooperatives in the energy sector. 
uh, locally from the interviews we, we we made we can find that the local conditions triggering the, the emergence of the project is to have uh, anti-nuclear uh, movement or reactions to to local um, to local projects uh, for nuclear uh, uh, waste management for example uh, they can be inspired by local or remote examples or local counter examples for example uh, private actors prospecting uh, uh, to, to build a windmill as well. And for the intermediaries, uh, they tend to emerge uh, as we hypothesize uh, when there are legal and administrative obstacles and that creates the need to, to lobby more actively and uh, the problem in accessing funding. So our future step for now is to continue this comparative analysis and, uh, and maybe build more uh, strong theory about why this uh, diffusion process is occurred this way. And, uh, and I'd be happy to discuss it more. And you can, uh, you will be able to find all of this, of course, in uh, our website. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alili and Yasmin, for this very nice joint presentation of your results. Um, are there any direct clarifying questions for Adeli and Yasmin? Uh, there were a lot of questions in the chat, but I'm... Um, yeah, there was a discussion going on okay, okay. <laughs> about the point that Tanya made and that we will pick up. But I wanted to see whether there's any direct question. So if that is not the case, then I suggest that we open now the panel so that we now have all the speakers um, entering into a discussion on the different topics that have been raised uh, during the presentation. So um, uh, one of the first topics that was brought up um, was a question by Daria, um, who was asking about differences across countries. And I think this question was uh, directly addressed to Chiara. And the question was, um, what was specific in Poland and Estonia, if I remember correctly? So, Chiara, could you yes, add a bit more yeah, to that, yeah. please? Yes, it was about the legal form in Poland and Estonia, because for the other countries, the prevailing legal form was uh, cooperative. Yeah, so um, for Poland, uh, I'm looking at some data as well. Um, there were few few answers, several answers for um, in terms of legal form for foundations and limited companies, but 73% uh, of the respondents chose a, a form that is called energy cluster, which is, seems to be a, 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 let's say an initiative promoted through agreements between municipalities, uh, energy operators, and an investor, I guess a private investor. In Poland, up to the end of 2020, there were not officially uh, registered any type of energy cooperatives. Whereas in Estonia, um, uh, 100% of the cars responded other uh, as a legal form, uh, but this, but in reality, this the, the majority of the legal forms, uh, the, the majority of cars in Estonia are established as associations, uh, in particular as apartment association, which apparently is a legal entity in Estonia, and the the initiatives that they started developing uh, re renewable energy production or, or other other energy related. Um, initiatives within their community used this apartment association as legal forms for their their activities. So I hope I was uh, I, I answered the question from Daria. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Kiera. I think we also saw that very nicely from the last presentation uh, from Adeli and Yasmin that uh, really the legal frameworks matter a lot and also the promotion policies for renewables matter a lot for the development of these initiatives. Um, yeah, let's maybe then move to this question that was brought up by Noam in reaction to Hang Yan's presentation. So if these people um, that are interested in investing in energy cooperatives are not so much interested in the collective experience and then really being in contact with the other members and 
influencing the decisions of the energy cooperative? Can we still speak from a collective action initiative and can we still speak from social innovation? And this question was then later broadened uh, towards the element of disruption. So if social innovation and collective action initiatives, yeah, per definition entail some element of disruption, where do you see it in your research in terms of is there any element of disruption when you talk to the members, maybe in terms of their behavior, the way they are thinking, um, or also more generally for the entire transition process? So maybe this is a question to, to all of you, whether in your research you came across such elements of disruption. Uh, can I say something? Or? Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Actually, it's a it's a very uh, insightful question, and and for for the the participation issue you mentioned, yes, we we found that from our general public sample <clears throat> that they are not quite interested about the participation. Uh, as as I have mentioned, that participation. Uh, <clears throat> It's a very important characteristic of energy cooperative and allows the members to 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 participate in a in the decision making of uh, of the organization's important affairs and they they are not quite interested and so uh, so there are two points I want to make first uh, in as, as as mentioned in my in my presentation cooperative members are actually interested uh, about those participatory meetings. And so that seems to suggest that uh, experience and a familiarity plays a role here. And second, uh, actually, we, we, we have also uh, asked the respondents uh, uh, whether they, so, so whether they are, uh, they think that decision uh, making rights uh, in the energy cooperative okay. is also, uh, important. Sie müssen nur wissen kurz vorher, wenn wir. Sorry. I think you are him. You need to uh, mute yourself. Um, yeah, I think that was an accident. Please go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. So I did I mute myself? Sorry. Uh, so yeah, so uh, basically, uh, so in, in fr fr uh, from our uh, survey uh, answers, uh, we find that uh, uh, even for the general public, uh, they think that uh, decision making rights uh, are important aspect of energy cooperative. So that implies that they do know that it is important. However, uh, in, in a separate uh, uh, um, method where we do a choice experiment, they do not care about uh, participatory meetings. So, so that, there's actually many uh, courses. So one is, is probably, uh, you, you can say that's because of the hypothetical bias of a choice experiment. So people uh, basically behave differently in, in the real world. And also um, I think, uh, so, our results are actually uh, supported by some other studies who also find that people are not that interested about participa participation meetings. So some of them simply treat this as a, a financial investment instead of uh, uh, like kind of a more participatory approach, uh, uh, which combines uh, both financial returns and, and environmental uh, uh, attitudes towards uh, renewable energy. So I think to, to my knowledge, uh, maybe there's a, a solution uh, to, to suggest for, uh, for energy cooperatives, they need to uh, find a, a more innovative way to promote uh, the energy cooperative, to, to, to make it more salient and, and clear to the general public that uh, 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 about the benefits of participating uh, in energy cooperatives, so so that in that case they won't see this as a, a, a pure financial investment. So that's my suggestion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for this additional explanation. Does one of the other speakers want to add to that from your experience? Yeah. 
may, maybe I can add to, to this from uh, actually our qualitative data, uh, qualitative um, uh, analysis findings as well, sort of uh, going this direction, showing that not many people are actually uh, interested in getting involved in the energy communities, um, let's say, more actively. Uh, some of them, yes, but a lot of uh, people actually want to, uh, as well, sort of um, um, continue with the business as usual. Uh, so as least as little interruption as possible uh, is perceived as a bigger value in a way to for joining to the energy community in a way. So trying to behave uh, uh, in a in a way as usual, uh, but for example, with some other benefits uh, that clean energy community can actually provide you. So um, yeah, maybe um, what we uh, what is related perhaps as well with our um, findings um, uh, through uh, along very different uh, energy communities uh, models. We could say maybe that place-based uh, energy communities, uh, uh, in place-based energy communities, people might show a bit bigger um, desire to, to get involved in the, in the, in the, uh, also in the meetings and uh, discuss perhaps uh, other issues with the, with the, living in the energy community is not necessarily related all, only to to practices and behaviors related to energy per se but also other things for example how to make community more sustainable how to support other uh, social practices within communities make them stronger as a community etc so it really depends what kind of values i think uh, people see in uh, um, in joining energy community. And I think this is then related as well with, with how much involved they want to get uh, with these communities. Any of the other speakers wants to add? Or maybe Noam, does this answer your question or is this what you were interested in? Um, uh, yes, thank you. I just wanted to raise that point of the, this qualitative point. So I think it's, it's been discussed. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. Good. Then there was another point of discussion that was actually already actively uh, discussed in the chat. This um, role of um, energy communities or collective action initiatives in triggering behavior change and change in social practices. And we heard Tanya say that um, yeah, people are not necessarily interested in being very, um, yeah, very energy, living very en energy conscious, but rather they want to in in uh, increase their comfort and use more energy and just have the good conscience that it's clean energy. Um, yeah, which led to a debate whether that is also, yeah, what is the intention of having energy communities or just entire energy transition, whether that is beneficial to the energy transition. So let's start this discussion then, please. Um, who wants to go first, sharing their insights? Maybe Tanya, because it um, was initially yes. <laughs> raised, <laughs> raised by you, the point. Yeah. Um, as, uh, as mentioned before, like uh, uh, just in my previous comment, is that uh, people do join energy communities for very different reasons. And uh, either this is like a financial incentive, uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's uh, people join because uh, of uh, wanting to live in a community, etc. So it, it really differs why people decide to join energy uh, communities in the first place. But uh, the initial results, which of course cannot be generalized because this was a qualitative uh, research, but I think it, the, the findings are, were still quite surprising, was that uh, some, some actually are motivated to join clean energy communities in order to be more free in their energy use. Some also expect that the... the um, that uh, um, consumption of energy will go up because, uh, let's say, electric cars and other things. 
and they want to be as free from big energy providers as possible, so leaving their comfort for a, a recent, let's say, price. Um, in these cases, for example, uh, uh, people do anticipate a bigger um, um, amount of energy consumed. However, they want a lot of people that join energy communities want to consume energy with a better conscious, in, as I said, uh, um, being really um, concerned with the carbon uh, footprint. So uh, this could, for example, be a very important uh, motivation. But energy preservation, perhaps... Um, you can see that this also differs across uh, energy communities and their business models and, and what kind of gadgets and technology as well uh, uh, households, for example, have installed. I would say, I mean, this is my assumption um, because uh, where, where, where people have um, uh, technology uh, sort of installed that inspires them to conserve energy, perhaps their um, conservation could be greater. But uh, we, we will also see that with the, the quantitative data uh, that we will get in the, in the further research. Uh, so uh, according just to this qualitative research, I cannot uh, uh, generalize on the wider population across the, the, the community members. Um, but I, I would really like to hear others' opinions as well, what, what actually to do. And uh, probably this is quite a, a big issue, actually, if the um, conservation of energy is not uh, a huge motivator for joining energy communities. But we saw also in Hang Yan's presentation that there were these clear differences between the community members and the general public. And that... Oh, there was no direct comparison in terms of energy use, but for example, they were more likely to have electric vehicles. So in that sense, there is probably also some difference or some impact on behavior. Yeah, maybe I would just add here something that I already written in, in, the, um, in the chat, that of course what we did find is that behavior, behavior did change uh, uh, for many people actually after uh, joining energy communities. For, for example, be, people did become more sensible for environmental issues. So maybe uh, the joining energy community didn't directly uh, change their uh, consumption practices according to energy, but it changed consumption practices with regard to other things that are also very important to consider, consider from an environmental perspective. So this sensibilization for environmental problems uh, is going on there, I think, and are, uh, it, it, I mean, has, has an impact the beyond actually conservation, energy conservation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Any other views on this topic still? Yeah, uh, hi, Julia. Sorry, I just mentioned uh, uh, my presentation, so maybe I can add something. So uh, in the results I haven't presented uh, <clears throat> here, yeah, we, we do find uh, some other difference between uh, uh, cooperative members and the general public. For example, their attitudes uh, <coughs> towards uh, wider impacts of energy uh, cooperatives. Uh, for example, uh, compared with the general public, cooperative members uh, think uh, are more likely to think that the impacts uh, uh, of uh, energy cooperatives, uh, sorry, the, the impacts of energy cooperatives on national uh, energy independence or regional energy independence or the impacts on energy markets and policies uh, are more are, are important. So I think, uh, yeah, that, that's probably, again, back to, to my uh, previous argument that uh, familiarity plays a role here is because members, uh, they have experience in, in, in involving uh, with uh, energy cooperatives. So they know how it works and uh, they, they understand better uh, what are the benefits and what are the important uh, the aspects of, of uh, energy cooperatives. So I think uh, 
that that's that's the things I want to add. Uh, let me let me see if oh so there's another aspect. So compared with the general public, quarter members uh, are more likely to think that the legal transparency of the energy cooperative is a very important aspect in uh, to secure uh, their investment uh, in investing energy cooperatives. So this is something. Uh, uh, also very interesting because uh, for, for the general public, they, they probably don't have a concept uh, about energy cooperative. So, however, for crowded members, they think that uh, the legal transparency uh, and, and the structure of the cooperatives, cooperatives are important. Uh, so I think, yeah, but, but for some other things, uh, we haven't observed a significant difference. And this is also very interesting. For example, for uh, decision rights uh, in investing new projects in, in reinvestment, and, and also, uh, uh, for example, for uh, uh, operators' successful background. So on these aspects, we do not observe a significant difference. So, so that means uh, they basically reach an agreement on, on this. So that's the things I want to add here. Okay, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I think officially the session is over and the uh, coffee break has started. However, I think we have another interesting question or topic raised by Chiara. So I invite everyone who still can stay or wants to stay that we also uh, discuss this topic. So Chiara um, raises the question um, on building trust in communities. And also the causality, whether the trust needs to be first before the community starts or you have the community and then trust is built. Um, so maybe, uh, Chiara, do you want to explain a bit why you came up with this question? Uh, yes, yes. The reason the, um, trust is often discussed as a uh, as an element, at least uh, in, in in this context, in terms of um, in general, it's discussed as a, as a facilitating uh, as, as an element that facilitates the 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 the, the, the building of the, um, the 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 birth of, of of new initiatives in a sense where in communities which have a sense of trust already developed, it's easier, it seems to be that it's easier to develop this type of initiatives. What I was interested, I'm, I've, I've been always interested is the, the reverse causality. So uh, evidence of the fact that if you, if for example, if you have uh, some initiator that initiate this initiative, uh, which aggregates people on energy services, energy production, whatever, on, on, on certain activities related to energy. Uh, uh, and then this initiative creates trust within the community by through through the participation. So it's, it's let's say trust is it's a byproduct of participation. I mean, that would be, this is something that interests me uh, to see if there is a, as I said, Basically, it's a positive social spillover of these initiatives onto the communities. And I would be, I've, I mean, I've been interested since a while on how we could potentially provide evidence for that and assess that and, and value that. That's, that's, that's the question. So I see some, some people are answering. Uh, Adelie, yeah, your I, answer I, is, is, is if I read well, it's it's on the opposite. So, so you're saying that uh, in contexts where trust is is more uh, available yeah, than yeah, but it's it's not easy to see trust because so I, we interviewed some intermediary actors, so I can only say whether there is a group dynamic or not, and uh, what we what we see is uh, that usually there is something that triggers. The emergence of the collective dynamic. So either they are contesting someone, something. Uh, we also we also have seen some uh, political list of green parties failing to the municipal election and starting energy cooperatives instead. So um, sometimes so there are pre-existing groups 
start deciding to to start something new. Uh, also, there are like some with uh, social movements and so on. Uh, so sometimes there is a pre pre existing social capital, we could say. Uh, sometimes the the intermediary organization organizes public meetings uh, because uh, they say that, well, there is some potential in this territory. So would someone would like to do this? And sometimes people just meet like that uh, and start something. And sometimes they do some meetings and even the municipality is involved and they would be happy to do something and no one answer and the mayonnaise is not uh, taking. So I would say it depends. <laughs> be, yeah. But I think you, need, you still need to trigger something because people won't uh, knock at doors of the neighbors to ask, do you want to start a cooperative? But I'm not sure it really works like that. Thank you. Now I see I see an answer from uh, Nevis, uh, uh, to which I fully agree with. I mean, uh, especially in low trust context, uh, it would be interesting to see if there is a, a positive, um, a positive, a positive effect of introducing this type of initiative. So, you are are you? Is this is this uh, just just a quick question to Nevis? Is this um, a publication you are? Uh, you're suggesting dealing with this issue? Well, I'll check that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, I don't know, Tanya, do you want to add on the trust issue, which was also part of your interviews? Sorry, here I am. <laughs> uh, yes. The, the uh, issue whether trust comes first or... Or yeah, what what did the people mention when they uh, refer to trust? I mean, trust is trust is um, actually talking about causality is really uh, difficult because it goes in in various direction, and of course, trust is built over time. People have some um, uh, let's say assumptions about who they can trust. And uh, once they get involved in, in the process of, for example, becoming energy community, uh, trust uh, um, evolves, actually. Um, for example, um, just now I could actually talk for a while on this, but for example, um, even joining energy communities uh, um, can be an issue of lack of trust in bigger um, systems, let's say, of uh, huge energy providers. So, you know, because of not trusting, uh, uh, let's say, the structure or big energy providers, some people decide to, to actually try to go off course and find an alternative um, for which, uh, on which they can actually count on themselves and not being afraid uh, of what is going to happen in the future. Um, with regard to, uh, to trusting uh, uh, other community members, at least from our qualitative results, I would, I would say that people are very positive about it in, in general, like uh, trusting other um, members of community, uh, of energy communities. Um, uh, but then uh, depends also uh, uh, on what actually you think about trust. For example, trusting in people getting involved uh, and actively participates might be, for example, um, less uh, uh, less evident, for example, or they even think, uh, some even think that not all people join uh, the energy communities for the same motives as, as themselves, so they don't trust them about those motives. Um, but, for example, uh, uh, the level of trust in the sense that uh, with, with uh, uh, joining the energy community, you will actually contribute to some positive uh, social and environmental change. I, I could say that there is trust uh, in that uh, and in, in that actually the processes in energy communities are going to be fair. Um, but it's it's a complex and it really always depends trust in who or in what uh so yeah but very important issues uh, it seems um according to our results mm -hmm. thank you tanya yeah i think it's interesting that you meant uh introduced this additional element of trust that trust can also be 
related to the big energy providers and be the reason for people to join an energy community. Um, yeah, now we took 10 minutes of the coffee break, so I suggest we close the session here, even though I think there would be much more to discuss, which the very active uh, chat activities showed us. Um, so yeah, I would like to thank four excellent speakers for really insightful presentations, and I want to thank a very active audience that um, raised very interesting questions that we will uh, take away uh, into our work in the EU projects and yeah, that I think also give new inspiration for our future work. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a nice coffee break.